Pan African Network, and also I'm the executive chair for the African Business Chamber in the UK. And I'll be supported by partner Dennis Aguma, who's a, a partner as SSG Consulting and co-chair for One Africa Network and a, a visiting lecturer at the Birmingham City University. So just before we start a bit of uh, housekeeping, uh, I'll be muting all the mic just to minimize the disruption. And also, if you hear any noise in the background, uh, don't mind if you hear kids crying or dogs or whatever. That's the new norm working from home. Um, the, this webcast will be 90 minutes. Hopefully, we'll be able to go through all the discussion and the exchange some ideas and the, take some questions before we wrap up around the 7.30. So before I start, I just wanted to give a bit of an overview in terms of uh, what One Africa is all about for those who doesn't know. So One Africa is a membership-based think tank and social development organization uh, launched in 2018, mainly focusing on the issue that affect black and African businesses, entrepreneurs, and the professionals. So we are committed to advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, excellence, inclusiveness, and the sustainable economic growth, both in the UK and across Africa. So we serve as, a, as an important catalyst for brokering ideas and the action, stimulate thought-provoking discussion and debate such as this one, and the offer practical solution to tackle and address world most pressing issues and problems, especially with COVID-19. I'm sure there's quite a lot of uh, things to look into. So our mission are only for connect, inspire, empower, and celebrate the success of our members. So over the last uh, few years, we, we've engaged uh, our members in many various ways, including discussion panel, networking, debate, and the, it's our, our vision is also to be hosting an excellence award and various growth uh, seminars and masterclass along the way. We've um, welcomed and uh, uh, my, my computer is a bit frozen. Sorry about that, my computer is just. <laughs> so over, over the last few months, we've welcomed various speakers from various walk of life leaders, business leaders, academia, professors, entrepreneurs, experts to share their views and uh, thoughts in terms of some of the uh, issues that are affecting our communities and they offer practical solution on how we can uh, tackle some of these challenges. And this, this is, these are some of the events that we've hosted over the last, and also we've, we've hosted a few events to to provide a platform for our member to connect with like-minded peers, to exchange ideas, opportunities to stimulate and uh, facilitate growth. So for today, we are, we, we are, our focus on the discussion is mainly looking at the impact of C19 and the future opportunity for the creative industry. But before I start, I just want to, to set the scene in terms of the creative industry. So thanks to Charlotte who shared the, this, this information uh, three months ago in, about uh, the creative industry. So I have to borrow from uh, her PowerPoint presentation. So basically <laughs> creative industry comprises of uh, 13 unique sectors for those who doesn't know, uh, ranging from advertisement, marketing, architecture, craft and design, TV, IT, publishing all the way to museum, gallery, music, video, and the health edge. And it's growing uh, every day. And this is how the, uh, some of the characteristics in terms of digital production and distribution across the spectrum uh, in terms of how they, they position themselves and how the, the digitization is influencing in terms of the output and the process. And for the UK, in the interest for the UK, this uh, data for the last two, two years ago in terms of how the sector is very important. Of course, around create jobs around the 3.2 million, one in every 
11 jobs in the UK are for the creative industry and the contribution around 80 to between 80 to 100 billion in GDP. So it's a quite huge sector. And of course, in terms of the spread across the region, you can see the South, mainly London and the, the South kind of dominates the landscape in terms of the participation in the, in the creative industry. However, over the last two, three months, we've, we have seen quite huge changes as a result of uh, COVID-19 that has disrupted some the industry and the economies. And of course, we, we all know COVID-19 is a human tragedy affecting millions of people across the globe. Our thoughts to everyone who's been affected and we hope everyone on this call is well and safe. And uh, and this also is a looming threat and threat and the uncharted territory to livelihood businesses and economies. We're already seeing quite a lot of um, business collapsing as a result of the COVID-19 and people losing jobs and situation has been evolving daily, very fluid, the very daily announcement shift from the government including lockdown, that's why most of us have uh, been restricted at home. And of course, at the center stage, we've seen digitization, home working and the gig economy taking space in terms of facilitating people for, to work from home. There's also other implication in terms of unemployment that is likely to come as a, as a result of job losses and the it's uh, financial difficulties as I do. So, and also part of the disruption also, there's a digitization in the, in the C19 age. So as part of the, the disruption, digitization is taking center stage from AI to virtual realities. During the lockdown, we've seen quite a lot of people being more creative to try and continue create content in terms of uh, virtual reality shows. We've seen people trying to replicate some of the painting, virtual exhibition and the gig and the music has taken center stage. I think in Germany, there was a, a nightclub that took place with over 1 million people, which is amazing. And of course, AI and the other artificial intelligence technology are shaping the way creative industry is likely to be in moving forward beyond COVID-19. So today we've prepared a few questions that, and topics that we're going to debate and we hopefully try to answer. And our objective is to, by the end of the discussion, is to provide practical solution, greatest trends and the guidance for people listening, entrepreneurs, leaders and the professionals to take away and help them to, to prepare for recovery as we enter in the new, new norm or the new economy as we emerge from the lockdown. And to help me answer some of these questions, I'm delighted to, to welcome our speakers. So without, without any arrangement, our, our first speaker is Anne Marie, who's a, CEO for the Lestres Global and award winner television for the, who's worked various in, in um, television from CNN to Reuters. I hope I'm correct, but she'll introduce herself uh, as we go along. And then we, unfortunately, Kenneth is unable to join us. He just had an, another meeting just been uh, planned this evening. So he sent his apology. Third, we have uh, uh, Dr. Charlotte Kelly, who's a senior lecturer at Birmingham City University and the co-chair for the creative industry at the ESB Institute of Business and Entrepreneurship. And third, we have Fiona Kekel from Immense UK and the lead for the creative industry, Innovate UK. Fourth, we have Amo Tawa, who's uh, the CEO for Punch Record and the Chairman Task Force for the Diversity at the, new, at the UK Music. And uh, Yemsi, a long-term friend of mine, and he's the, she's the CEO for, and the producer for Hatch Ideas 
based in London. And finally, we have Janelle Alfred, creative strategist with uh, she ran her consulting company called GAA Consulting and, and a journalist for various uh, TV, including BBC, ITN and ITV. So welcome. The, and uh, um, I'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, probably if you can give us a bit of um, overview in terms of what you do, your background, and also help us to answer the first question in terms of how the, and how the, the creative industry is shifting from your own world. Some of the disruption you've seen in the last few months that are likely to, to reshape the industry, the work as they are work in the, in the industry as usual. So if I start with uh, Mali to, to kick off the introduction. Hi, Mali. Hi. Hi. If you can introduce yourself and give a bit of background about yourself, some of the okay. work you've been doing, and also give us a bit of um, insight in, in, into your world, how it has been reshaped as part of C19. And where do you see things moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, so, hi everyone. My name is uh, Marie. So, I've been um, uh, an entrepreneur in the creative space in Africa for 15 years. Um, I worked in Kenya first for 10 years. I, uh, I first came there as a journalist. I have a background as a journalist, but I'm not a journalist anymore. Um, I, I created some TV shows. I, um, I own a, a production studio in Kenya, uh, launched a few other businesses in VOD and talent management. Uh, and for the past seven years, um, my main market has actually been Nigeria. And uh, what I do mostly now is that I, used uh, all the experience that I've gathered over the years in many different um, sectors of the creative industries uh, to advise international companies, institutions, or investors who want to come in uh, to Africa in the creative space. Uh, so, so I run my own uh, strategic advisory firm, and I still also have a production activity um, uh, active on the side as well. So how um, has the crisis impacted me so far? Well, first of all, I, I can't be in Africa. I've been under uh, confinement in the, my family country house since March 16th in France. Um, so of course we're doing everything remotely on, on Zoom and WhatsApp and everything. Uh, it hasn't, the, the, the pace has not slowed down because uh, of course, my main market is Nigeria and Nigerians work all the time. So just everybody has pivoted very quickly. Uh, some of my clients or partners have, have been impacted quite a bit because their businesses um, depend on uh, venues. So either, you know, uh, cinema um, chains or, you know, music venues or um, I do sports business as well. So anything that has to do with, uh, you know, places where people have to congregate, everything has shut down, obviously. So, so everybody who was dependent on that uh, has to wait and has to try to do something else. Uh, but people have pivoted very quickly. Uh, I'm sure we'll have the, the opportunity to talk more uh, in the rest of the conversation, but of course everybody has moved online. There's been a lot of creativity as to how to use uh, various tools. Social media has exploded, um, Instagram Live, TikTok. It's, you know, lots of great things being done uh, when it comes to content, um, content uh, production. So you can't be on a film set, but everybody's creating new content, writing. So this is still going on. Uh, on the fashion side, of course, nobody's buying clothes at the moment, but the fashion industry has been coming together to think about the future of fashion and collaborate and find um, maybe a new way of working. So I think, of course, it's, it's, it's a bad time for a lot of people. A lot of businesses are going to uh, struggle and some are going to close down. But I've actually also been uh, quite um, uh, impressed and I'm being quite optimistic uh, looking at the creativity that's coming out of it and the new solutions that are coming out of it. Thank you, thank you, Mali, for that brief introduction. 
and we hope to 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 learn more and hear some of the work you've been doing internationally especially in the creative industry uh, if i go to our next speaker dr charlotte and also to give a bit of um, intro and also share some of the the shift of the trend we've seen in the last few weeks or months and of course coming from that, that introduction some of the landscape i showed and where some of the changes are coming from uh yeah thank you uh eugene and i mean who'd have thought it when i was uh joined you in january how things have shifted so a lot of those um kind of characteristics uh, that I'll, I'll come back to actually in, in a moment of, of that we talked about in January uh, the impact they are having uh, kind of on the sector so um, yeah my, just as an introduction to myself my name's uh, Charlotte Carey and I'm a, a, a lecturer senior lecturer in creative industries marketing at Birmingham City uh, University Business School um, and I've been working in as a sort of uh, researching the creative industries for the last sort of uh, 15 years or so. I should say that uh, prior to that, uh, in my first degree, I did a fine art degree. And um, I, I, like many people who do fine art degrees, I, I struggle to shake off my uh, artistic identity. So <clears throat> that, you know, while I'm waiting for that to work out, I'm a lecturer. Um, so, I mean, a lot of things that uh, that both both uh, Eugene and Marie have said. I, I think probably I was going to say. I think maybe uh, I have obviously a more UK perspective, I suppose. Uh, and so, one of the things that kind of re re when I when I'm teaching uh, creative industries, entrepreneurship, and marketing to our business school students, I'll often say to them, you know, in the in kind of uh, week one, I'll say, you know just think back after I've identified all the different subsectors and I'll, I'll sort of say, well, you know, in the last sort of 24 hours uh, or in the last two weeks, maybe, I want you to list everything, every kind of creative industries output you've come into contact with. Um, and when we went into lockdown, I thought, oh my Christ, you know, this is really kind of accelerated. I feel like I'm spending my life on Netflix and, you know, I, I just, you know, my need to consume kind of, uh, creative output sort of accelerated albeit I felt really kind of at odds at people not social distancing on TV um, but the so one of the I guess there's a kind of odd thing that I I, I think there's on the one hand I think perhaps uh, the market is um, much more aware of how much uh, it needs that kind of creative output in terms of music and uh, films and TV and you know drama and what all of those things um, and then on the flip side of course the sectors going through this uh, you know really awful kind of situation where in a where I, th I think there's a kind of very mixed sort of scene where there, and I, I wonder if it's a bit of a fight or flight kind of scenario where some people are able to pivot to kind of be positive about the potential opportunities that are afforded um, by having to kind of really think laterally about how they can continue their practice or carry on working in the sector. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, particularly kind of sectors uh, which are kind of performance based might be, you know, where venues are potentially closing. And these kind of things uh, maybe having a very different sort of experience. Um, so, other thing, I mean, when I was talking about characteristics also previously, uh, so when we met in January, I was kind of going, okay, the characteristics of the creative industries, you know, it's heavily reliant on freelancers, uh, it's project based, it relies on networking, uh, you know, and, and some of those characteristics are kind of coming to play uh, you know in terms of how um, the sector is responding in this situation and certainly I think for a lot of people it's problematic in terms of um, where you, you know if you're uh, my understanding is a lot of kind of small creative businesses uh, kind of falling through some of the kind of um, some of the sort of uh, safety net that's been kind of put in place they're not necessarily uh, able to um, 
you know, unable to kind of furlough staff or perhaps they're a limited company, so they're unable to get a kind of support as a sort of self-employed person. Perhaps they work as what we kind of would refer to as sort of portfolio working where you might be reliant on some PAYE um, pay, but you might also uh, have a kind of a mixed kind of um, sort of a uh, uh, sort of work that you might be doing so i think that that can also be um problematic i feel like i'm being negative but i, I mean i just sort of the, re the realities i think of of of, of the, the impact of this on on a lot of kind of small businesses um i have seen you know some really interesting things going on actually kind of locally um i've seen the kind of community of creative industries kind of pulling together um and maybe those are some of the things we can talk about. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Culture Cent Central uh, has uh, put in place, which I'm sure many of you maybe have kind of joined um, this sort of um, kind of uh, response unit where they kind of, I think there's about 1300 uh, creatives who are now on the, their kind of Facebook group and they're kind of sharing a lot of resources and those sorts of things. Um, and, and, and seeing a lot of, uh, you know, examples of that kind of pivoting of kind of, uh, for, uh, again, very locally to, to the West Midlands, for example, the kind of uh, Flatpak Festival, Film Festival that recently kind of happened online instead of in, in all the kind of venues where it would ordinarily happen. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's there's a, there's a lot going on. I guess the other thing to say is, um, and, and I, I can I can just I can see there's some other academics on the call. There, there's a, there's a research um, agenda as well, I suppose, within this. So if you do kind of follow any of those links, there are quite a lot of uh, organisations who are kind of really trying to map out and capture the impact that this is having, so that they can then inform kind of policy makers. So you may see there's quite a lot of surveys uh, around. Um, to trying to kind of establish and understand uh, what what impact this is having on on creative uh, uh, industries businesses. So yeah, that's me. Thank you, Charlotte, for the introduction. And uh, of course, we are looking forward to learn more in terms of uh, some of the where do you see moving forward the key key models and the strategies to help our audience position themselves competitively. Uh, if I go to our next speaker, Fiona. I, I know the government is very passionate and to unlock more opportunities in the creative industry because of the potential and the Innovate UK has done an, a very um, commendable job to, to support the creative industry. If, if you'd introduce yourself and give, give a bit of a flavor in terms of some of the work you've been doing and also help us to understand some of this disruption you've seen from uh, a UK or whatever perspective, and um, that would be great. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Fiona Kilkelly, and I um, run Immerse UK, which is the UK's immersive technology network and also lead on creative industries at the Knowledge Transfer Network, which is funded by Innovate UK. So I'm not an Innovate UK spokesperson, but we work very closely with Innovate UK in terms of helping inform funding priorities and engaging businesses on the ground. So we're very much at the coal face, working with the sector all the time. Um, and in Immerse UK, the network I set up four years ago, we've got about 4,000 members, um, and that's across enterprise and creative industries. The whole point being, we want to bring enterprise and creative, the creative industry sector together. Um, and uh, we just put in place immediately a pretty kind of rapid response um, program of activity um, in early March to support the sector. Um, and it means meeting businesses all the time and just talking to people and seeing where we can help. And you're absolutely right, Eugene, the government has stepped in with a significant amount of particularly early stage R&D funding, which is an area we're really interested in, in a nascent sector like immersive. Um, and Innovate UK had uh, uh, the Fast Start Fund, which launched in April, had a quick five, so April, yeah, had a quick five week turnaround. Um, those, some of those, the, all of the winners from that first competition were announced today, um, one of which was a virtual um, VR uh, training simulator for surgeons. So really interesting bag of interventions across enterprise and creative being um, given pots of R&D money to try and quickly, quickly, quickly get some new products and services on the ground, which will meet 
the demands of the consumers and business in terms of COVID-19. Um, but the bit I'm really interested in is immersive and creative industries. Um, and you'd think if AR and VR is ever going to succeed, it will succeed in, in a time that we're living through right now, uh, because you've got to deal with not being able to be in front of somebody in the same room. Uh, you've got to social distance, you've got to work from home. You can't go and see cultural, uh, you can't go and see theatre, music and so on. Um, and we've seen really interesting challenges, but really interesting opportunities for the sector. Um, the challenges for, um, as, as um, Charlotte mentioned, particularly for the smaller creative companies who have, have you know, under five, under 10 employees who can't particularly furlough staff and can't furlough themselves. So the support to keep those companies alive doesn't really work for them. The bigger companies, um, so when you talk about the creative industries in particular, I'm talking about perhaps film and TV, unprecedented accelerated disruption on a scale never seen before. With um, Neil Peplow from the BFI was saying the other day, you know, that the, the UK film sector is using, losing 3.4 million a day at the moment. Cinemas are shut, uh, it's catastrophic, the South Bank's shut. Um, major challenge for the sector, but at the same time, in the film, film industry, you see um, uh, The Mandalorian um, looking at new virtual production techniques, how VR and using um, um, uh, engine, game engines used in the game sector are starting to actually replace traditional production on a movie set. So in a time of COVID-19, there's a fantastic opportunity there to see how AR and VR can fill the pipeline. Um, and then also, I think, challenges for location, any location-based experience. Um, if, whether you're a straight, um, uh, a straight up theatre, traditional theatre, um, whether you're a music venue, uh, not having audiences in your building is a big problem. Um, and expect the ex expected impact of all of that is yet to be seen. But at the same time, it means that people like the Royal Shakespeare Company and Sarah Ellis will say, this is a huge opportunity for us. We really need to rethink our audiences, how we engage with them, what we do as a business, what is it the Royal Shakespeare Company is here to do, and use it as an opportunity for the better to create change within the organisation. So I'm in that space of great challenges, but great opportunities. Welcome, Fiona. Thank you so much for that brief introduction. Also, clearly, you mentioned, of course, the the TV industry, people in the lockdown, uh, including me, I've watched many soaps that I never watched in, in the last 10 years. So it's kind of uh, shifted quite a lot. And, uh, and if, if I go to our next speaker, um, Amo. Um, Amo is also, if you can give us a flavor in terms of how they introduce yourself, of course, and also give us a flavor in terms of how the, mu the music industry is changing and the situation some of the disruption you've seen in the in the in the within your space sure so uh, i'm amatawa director of punch for a music organization based in birmingham we do uh three things we, uh, we produce a festival uh we tour artists uh, we're part of the gig economy and then we do quite a lot of work around talent development um so Obviously, COVID has affected every single component of the business. Um, we're aware that if you look at the sort of back to back to what it was like, even though it doesn't exist, uh, the festivals and the gig economy is going to be right at the end of the taper. So, um, the the obviously music industry has been hit phenomenally. The whole supply chain from venues. Uh, tech guys, uh, uh, um, uh, artists, publishing companies, managers, agents, that whole supply chain has been disrupted. Um, some major, major hurdles and issues straight away. So things like independent venues, uh, 500, 550 across the UK, uh, they really fall in between the cracks. So they're not supported by large conglomerates like Live Nation or Academy. They fall in between the tracks in terms of getting resources and funding from the public sector. And also a lot of these independent venues, they're the, they're the heartbeat of the emerging artists. So, uh, and most of these venues have got the, the major developers generally 
hovering around, uh, hovering around them. Uh, and so uh, our thing was to very much protect uh, and look at I I independent venues and how do we support them from a, a from a sort of uh, sort of city region perspective. Uh, uh, so uh, th th there's a whole thing around uh, a real fast-paced emergency funds, like who and who 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 are ready to actually uh, even apply for these emergency funds. And if you look at a lot of the small SMEs, not just music, but across the board, a lot of people struggle just to kind of get forms in within a week. So loads of companies, loads of small companies, they're just falling in between the cracks. There's a really big thing at the moment, uh, the three R's. I don't know if anybody's heard of them. Uh, relief, recovery and renewal. Uh, I don't know who's invented these words, but obviously relief is, you know, all the investment that's been pump primed, uh, whether it's furlough, whether it's big government funds, uh, we need that, obviously. Uh, recovery, obviously, there's going to be a phase. Some organisations are, are in recovery. Uh, some will be going into recovery and then renewal. But, uh, you know, we've been talking internally within the music sector saying we just need to just pause. Uh, so relief and recovery are standard, but actually before we get back to renewal, we should revise and, uh, and so we should pause and think about what do we need to do differently to make things better rather than go back to what we, what we were doing. Because obviously, if you look at ethnic minorities, I'm from Birmingham, we're 43% BAME. Uh, our, our black and Asian communities are suffering the most. Uh, and, and so when you're looking at all these programs, and you're looking at the creative economy it's really important that we just just pause and re revise what we do before we start looking at renewal and regeneration uh, and and you know that it, it, it's it's really everyone's got their own stories it's really complex the, the music industry is suffering uh, just as just as much as most of the other creative economies are uh, uh, whether it's film, publishing, fashion, arts, we're a people's economy. So, um, uh, but you know, there is innovation, and uh, you know, so one example I want to just share with colleagues is, uh, and it's coming from independent venues, is how do we how do we become uh, during social distancing? How do we still have a semi-sustainable businesses? And do we look at things like people sitting down rather than standing up? Uh, uh, do we look at you know live streaming? So I know in Manchester they've uh, the the combined authority with their music board they've got this thing called United We Stream, which is all about uh, looking at a commercial model of streaming uh, and doing some really really big kind of citywide things. We have to do this thing very very slowly because what you need is you need buying from the audiences, not just people who work in the creative economy. Thank you, Amo, for that brief introduction and some of the key things that are reshaping the, the music industry and the, some of the changes we've seen in the, in the last few months. And so if I go to YMC, YMC, I know you've also been very active in the fashion industry, especially in London and the Ghana and some of the working with various um, African creative uh, entrepreneurs. If also introduce yourself first and also give us a flavor of some of the things you've been doing within the UK and of course at the African market and some of the shift, the trend, the transformation you've seen in the last few months as a result of C19 and Definitely, thank you. Um, so my name is Yemi Sinukulu and I've got an agency called Hatch Ideas. I started my career as an events producer, festival producer and in London and um, through a lot of perseverance, hard work, was able to host African club nights and um, festivals across central London. And through that work, it was really clear to me that there was a lot of support that creative practitioners needed. And so Hatch was born. And um, so up until today, we support creative businesses and we support entrepreneurs to develop their business and project ideas. 
and um, we set up Hatch Africa in 2012 so that we could provide the same support um, across the continent. And currently today, we're operating in seven countries across the continent, um, working in partnership with incubators in um, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, um, Ghana, um, um, Senegal, and so on. So, but um, as um, many people, I still keep that producers, um, it's, it's just in your blood, <laughs> you know. Um, to, so um, I still produce a festival. We run Asabaka Festival in Ghana. And some people have been saying that we might actually have been the last festival before the lockdown because it was hosted. Um, what was the date? I can't even remember now. Um, the, the 8th, the 4th to the 8th something of March anyway. And, um, and that was really interesting because at that point, we were starting to get all these really dramatic, panicked WhatsApp messages from people in Europe. Well, we're trying to sun ourselves in Ghana and they're telling us that people are dying. And we were like, what is going on? You know, and um, we, don't have, we didn't have access to the news. You know, we were there to have a festival. And then all of a sudden, um, we started to hear announcements about how we had to create social distancing. I don't even know what that is. Um, you know, so we had to then actually figure out what these terms meant, these concepts meant, before the government had even articulated them. And then we realised it was a global thing and the miscommunication um, actually it create, obviously we all know created a lot of panic and we had situations where we didn't know whether we could um, travel from Ghana back to our respective countries and you know airports were being shut down and we didn't know whether it was the apocalypse or whether it was just like a two-week thing but then very quickly I think people started to realize that the whole lockdown vision or dream that they had that there would be um, you know aliens coming from space um, started to turn into us actually sitting down being very mindful and reading and just being in shock and potentially just pausing and you know some of the things that I've noticed which I think has been magnanimous from everybody is how human a lot of people have been I've really noticed that when we start our conversations we acknowledge each other and how we're feeling I've noticed um, sometimes when I have meetings we do a little bit of a silence because we have to you know we take um, note of the gravity of the situation but in tangible terms um, in terms of the creative businesses and the clients I've been engaged with it's the good the bad and the ugly isn't it you know institutions have had to go on hiatus they've paused contracts um, you know they've had to scale down operations but the up but then they're redirecting resources um, where they would never have done so that they can create emergency grants and I think many people are familiar with the efforts of the Arts Council in that regard and they're trying to offer webinars and assimilate information and data so that um, all the players within the sector are as informed as possible and um, you know there could be more engagement in terms of getting all the stakeholders to feed into the solution but I think that um, the conversation is open and where I would never have, never have been able to speak with certain individuals because of um, either they're, in a, they're not accessible, they are now, you know, those emails are being opened and um, for example, we work with a lot of people in the financial um, services and they've always side put the creative industry to the back burner and now they're actually listening and um, keen to understand how they can engage with the creative industries as investors. Um, no, you know, this has been already expressed, business agencies and organisations, you know, um, they're having to make radical cuts, um, they're applying for the grants, they're furloughing staff if they can, um, th some of the support that's in place isn't really um, hitting the mark and that's something that we really need to look at more um, the fact that the creative industries is slipping through the cracks and I haven't yet seen that much being put in place to address that it's been talked about a lot but I haven't really seen anything robust enough to address that um, there's a lot of um, what you know um, 
museums and theatres, opening archives and catalogues. But in terms of artists and this and everything I'm saying, I believe um, cuts across the globe. So it's um, relevant both um, in the UK and across Africa. But, you know, um, artists are um, scouring for contracts, you know, tightening their belts presenting themselves online we've already talked about that experimenting but one of the things that i've noticed is that they're actually taking the time to actually develop their own content where they would never have been able to there's this sense of like oh okay then i might as well just do that track that i needed to do or you know crack on with that autobiography or whatever it is um so there's that sense there as well and you know having to get whatever tax credits or anything that they're able to get hold of but the other thing that I've seen which has been really powerful is how the creative industries has engaged with the solution so um, I've had friends of mine who've um, produced PPE equipment um, with 3d printers or um, face masks people have just instantly gone online doing storytelling engaged with the school's closure and providing um, education that's uh, more engaging for children the music concerts, the DJ sets. Um, I think when we look at it in the frame of the creative industries being part of the solution and how we do, um, um, uh, you know, reset, you know, and, you know, and get, get past, um, get past this kind of like immediate COVID crisis, then I really think that we need to capture that and really make a case for the creative industries. Um, and, you know, just wanted to finish on the fact that, you know, when it hit, um, and I think we have to appreciate that a lot of people um, have within, I mean, myself included, you know, we are sensitive in a way whereby um, it really did hit us um, uh, emotionally and our well-being. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's, it's become really evident to me that a lot of people within the creative industries are intuitive on a level that potentially we don't realize is so valuable and so they've been lending their um selves to people in a way which is you know they're not asking for fees or money for all of this content that they're providing so we need to start thinking about how do we protect that and what kind of new um ways in which we look at ip and copyright and yeah, and um, I think, you know, the conversation will go on, but it's definitely um, taking it day by day. And I think that at this point, a lot of people are just having to survive. Yes, there's loads of opportunities, but I think the main focus right now is cutting back, surviving and keeping, you know, sane and um, yeah. And, and keeping, yeah, basically keeping your mental health and keeping um, yourself together. Mm -hmm. ah, thanks, EMC. It's good you mentioned uh, creative industry has, in, has been part of the solution. Yes, we, during the lockdown, of course, entertainment, we've seen quite a lot of uh, uh, creativity coming out of the lockdown, which is going to be our next question. But before I go to that question, let me also welcome Janelle also to introduce herself and also give us a flavor in terms of some of the changes that we've seen, especially in the, in the TV and the reporting industry, because I know they've been at the forefront reporting all the latest updates, but at the same time, they are faced with so many challenges because the, the, news, the media, the news is a wash of so much information. Sometimes you don't know the truth and the reliability. At the same time, the public is also expecting looking towards the news to to report the right way inform the public how has been the situation in, in your in your side Janelle? hi thanks for having me and hello everybody so i think um i'm going to try not to rehash what everybody said because i feel like people have covered quite a bit of ground already i think so in january i have been worked in media for 13 years in front of the camera mainly behind the camera taken a couple of sabbaticals to senior management in terms of 
running a channel and also um, working as head of digital strategy. So comms and digital is really the things that I engage with the most. And also, as well as that, in January, started consulting, which was great because then COVID hit and then I was like, what have I done? But equally, I think in terms of what I think COVID has done in, in the industry, because media was and news was really becoming more digital anyway. So that was already happening. So I think what COVID has done in our industry is it has sped up kind of what was already beginning to happen. So in that terms, I think COVID is really, um, it's like a magnifying glass. And so the businesses and the, and the media outlets that were maybe just kind of hanging on, they're struggling the most. It's kind of sped up that process. And the ones who were already beginning to pivot had already become more digital, already online offering free content, et cetera they have continued to expand and accelerate in those things because they kind of had the head start. I think the other thing that we've seen and some other people have touched on it in terms of creating content online is that mainstream has, it's accelerated its fragmentedness. So whereas before, you know, something's happening, the first thing you're going to do is switch on the TV and watch the news. The first thing most people are going to do now is switch on social media to see what's happening. And I think that is something that is as well amplified and ramped up which is good and bad in some parts, because while some people say they just wanna hear from trusted media outlets, actually a lot of people don't trust the trusted media outlets and are actually looking to other places to kind of get their news, media and information. So I think in that sense, it has provided greater opportunities and you kind of see it in spaces like with the press briefings. So in the beginning, it was just kind of Sky News, the BBC, the usual players. And then after not long, other digital outlets who've come up in the last five years or so, actually they wanted an opportunity to be there questioning politicians as well because they have massive audiences and are very viable to be in that space. So I think it really is just an acceleration and, and a pushing forward of what was already beginning to happen. And I think in terms of content creators, people making content, especially independently and free, is that I think this is actually a good moment for them to capture new audiences that they were not potentially going to be in front of before. And so a lot of them are actually embracing that change and really pushing that forward. So I think in terms of where that will continue to go, I think a, a lot of the very disciplined creatives, um, there are some of them out there, I think they're kind of the ones that are actually probably going to be emerge as some of the winners with larger audiences having had eyes on them that previously weren't there and now just need to look at how they can monetize that going forward, which will be tricky because there's so much free stuff at the moment to get people to want to pay in a very limited financial situation that's going to be coming after this will be tricky for some people but I do think people are going to find ways increasingly to monetize what they're doing which I think is a positive thing and then, and also finally because I know time is going you know I think the people that are likely the creatives in media who are going to win are going to be the strategists the people who are really already beginning to plot a way and, and see a way for themselves to win and also the connectors and the networkers because at the moment there are lots of free things so it's who can you kind of pull into your sphere to get on your thing, to get more eyes on what you're doing? And so I think in terms of digital opportunities in media, they were already growing and expanding, but I think they are expanding more. And that's by necessity because a lot of journalists have been furloughed or formed through the cracks, self-employed. So actually they're turning their skills into things that eventually they will be able to monetize. But at the moment they're giving them away for free. So mm -hmm. I guess in my mind, I think, you know, and it probably sounds really harsh, but some of the things that just weren't viable before that were hanging on kind of by a thread, they have been made not viable. And the things that were maybe starting to gain traction or some of those people where things weren't viable have managed to pivot and should be able to hopefully find a way out. But I think in moments like this, there are losers and that's the wrong term, but there are people who lose out and there are people who, who manage to make it work for them. And I think in media, we're probably seeing that and it will become more magnified as the months go on. Thanks, Regina, for that brief introduction in terms of some of the things that has been taking place of course, in the media also. So uh, I think you mentioned something about uh, strategy taking center stage. Of course, this will take us to our next question in terms of 
as we are we we plan for recovery we know during lockdown there have been quite a lot of creativity innovation and the entrepreneurs getting creative on the social media and from what we want to to hear from our speaker is uh, what are the opportunities moving forward as we prepare for recovery what are the survival and the winning strategy at least to help our audience looking to emerge competitively where the opportunities they should be looking for will be the best way to reposition themselves so probably i'll probably start with uh, sharon and fiona from a a, a a strategic planning perspective where do you see the opportunities coming coming from the creative industry what will be the winning and survival strategy as entrepreneurs and the businesses emerge from lockdown for for growth who want to start fiona you want to start or charlotte i'm happy to kick off on that sorry i was on mute okay um, uh, what we're seeing in the creative sector really and, and bear in mind a lot of the creative industries we work with are tech in some way tech focused or tech enabled um, is well we did some research last year in our immersive economy report and we found that um, two thirds of the businesses that we surveyed were starting to pivot and develop solutions in sectors outside of the creative industries so I think there's a huge opportunity for the creative industries, particularly the game, the game sector, to, to share and lend and collaborate with other industries who need to pivot and move into a non-traditional uh, or alternative or a new way of engaging audiences or reaching out to consumers. Um, there's a lot of knowledge there that's traditionally been siloed. And I think for any creative company that has unique IP, and any unique proprietary software has the ownership of that, then you're kind of out of a much stronger position than, than, than creative companies who don't. Um, and I think very much internationally, the view is what's the UK good at? It's it's a thriving creative industry sector. It's the stories from, from the people who are working, living, breathing the creative industries here in the UK today, that it's, 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 it's strength. And I really, do truly can see an opportunity for the UK's creative sector and all of us working in it to really be at the forefront of reshaping and rethinking what it means to be a creative business going forward and as storytellers and as creators what's the opportunity that this presents given all the amazing things I mean like particularly I liked what EMC was saying around it's about us having to be more mindful and thoughtful about what we do and more collaborative so I think if you take that frame of mind and that approach, um, it does feel to me that technology has to play a part in, in, in the new opportunities. Um, and that can be a small T or a big T. Um, and I think for me, the most important bit then is getting some R&D money into the, those companies' hands so they can actually just have a go risk-free at trying it out and doing new things. You know, Epic Games ran a massive um, music concert in Fortnite two weeks ago uh, with millions and millions, four, four simultaneously streamed concerts um, with millions and millions of eyeballs. You know, what could that mean, ammo, to some of the independent labels in that environment? You know, where, but you know, a, a small company with, with, with four people who are who are got their nose to the grind keeping a business alive don't have the capacity to get to, to do huge amounts of new r d so how can we help them do it you know who can we put them in touch with who they can collaborate with so that's where we're at now is the be aware collaborate get the money into the system flush out new ideas um make them risk-free uh think differently about who you how you work and who you work with Thank you, Fiona. How about you, Charlotte? What's your thought in terms of uh, where the opportunities are likely to come from and what will be the winning strategies uh, to help our audience be, stay ahead of the curve? Um, I, well, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, I, I, I agree with a, a lot of the points that Fiona just made. And I think um, 
yeah there's a number i mean i guess as a marketing lecturer i i, I you know from my perspective i'm thinking okay let's just figure out this think, think about this from a marketing perspective you know where where what, what what you know what what market need can we uh, are we are we going to try and solve and and uh, i think a lot of the um i know but of course i know many you know if you're that's not necessarily everyone's area of expertise so i think that area of collaboration is really important i think working with your kind of the community of create the kind of you know I think there's a really a various point I can't remember who said it about this thing of like acknowledging um how how actually I think it might have maybe in the embassy saying about, uh, about how kind of human people are uh, you know the kind of human nature the way people have kind you know I've suddenly I know everyone on my street's name when I didn't you know since the whatsapp group and everything you know and and I think that kind of that's been a really it's almost kind of harnessing some of that and going okay yeah we need to collaborate we need to work together because actually I don't know how to do x y and z but I think that might be a way for me to kind of grow my business or sustain my business or kind of um so I think there's something around yeah the acceleration of for a lot of for a lot of creative businesses it's going to be around yeah we've been thinking about doing this but now we really have to do this has become kind of business critical so we have to kind of um kind of move into the either the online what likely and, and, and sort of tech solutions um there's another as so i think that that community collaboration um and 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 you know maybe taking some risks in that way uh in, in doing some some things I, I i've got a bit of an i get a bit worried one of the things that does concern me though and i don't know how everyone else feels about this but this thing about so i mean uh, I teach content marketing so we talk about content creators talk about influencers and this kind of thing and then sometimes I think and then when I have my creative industries hat on I kind of think oh well like these boundaries are getting really blurred between the people who are and you have these sort of professional content creators um, but then our filmmakers our artists are they content creators I think maybe they think they're kind of artists or they're filmmakers as opposed to content creators and I think some of those boundaries are getting a bit blurred um and and I think uh Janelle that was you know I think maybe there's some of the point you're making about how you kind of monetize some of that you know if people are kind of thinking right I'm now seeing my creative product as as content you know and, and does that in some way um you know undermine it in some ways and now it's kind of become sort of disposable content that I can uh, just sort of you know I'm giving it away uh, or whatever uh, I, I haven't got an answer to that incidentally that but that's something that I think I'd, or maybe if I think about it from a marketing perspective I think okay this is like a pricing strategy we need to think about uh, and how you kind of position things and that kind of thing um, anyway I'm waffling but I just think that there's, there's something in that that uh, around that yeah how do you how do you communicate the value of your kind of creative output um in in a in a digital uh, uh arena i guess because i think that's going to be that's going to be the challenge i think for a lot of people is it's, it's kind of it is it's about monetizing but also about communicating the value so yeah thank you charlotte of course it's good to it's good that you mentioned about value creation and also delivery to, to consumer because at the same time we are expecting some as we come out of the lockdown or, or during the lockdown some of the consumer expectation and experience have changed so probably as we come out also what we we consider we used to think is value or the value will have changed and and delivery model expectation of course will be different and the, there will be quite a lot of learning curve and uh, as we move forward. If I go to Marie in, in terms of, uh, do you agree also with uh, Fiona and uh, Charlotte? And uh, I know you, some of your work has been mainly in the fashion industry. Where are you likely to see the creativity opportunities and the, what are the, the feature ahead and what are the winning strategies that you think it would be best moving forward? Well, I, I work only on the African market, so I think it's it's a very, very different context and a different, very different um, level of uh, development. So we're it's almost like we're talking about two different worlds. There's no government support or anything like that. It's very much uh, entrepreneurship based. Uh, it's very hard to be 
uh, just uh, to, to consider yourself just an artist without having some sort of a business because then there's really nothing to support you. So, so my work is really from the business side in the creative industries. Uh, and what, um, what has been, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at the silver lining, right? So I've, we've talked about all the things that of course cannot happen and that are difficult and the businesses that might suffer or die and the venues being closed and people losing their jobs. Um, however, one, one thing that this crisis is, uh, one of the impact that it's having that I think is ultimately uh, extremely uh, positive or will be in the end uh, for the creative industries in Africa is the forced, forced uh, digitalization of the market. So everybody now has to go online. Um, it's the, and everybody's working to increase the capacity because of course we know that uh, it's not a given that everybody can go online. Uh, you know, not everybody, of course, has a smartphone or a computer. Uh, not everybody can afford data. Data is expensive. And so we're seeing a massive, massive movement from um, telcos, uh, you know, slashing rates, uh, making uh, data uh, free or very affordable for people to get online. Uh, so mostly for people who need to work from home or families who need to, uh, you know, have kids who need to um, use the computer or their phones to learn while they're under lockdown. Uh, but that also benefits, uh, you know, the, the consumption of content, whether it is video or music or any other digital creative content. Uh, so that's happening. Uh, just a few days ago, there was the announcement of a new undersea uh, cable uh, financed by Facebook and MTN and some Chinese companies uh, that is going to more than double the internet capacity of 16 African countries. It's going to have landing points uh, all across the continent. There's Google's um, Loom company. It's the balloons, the 4G balloons that they are in rural areas in Kenya now. They've just signed a deal to do the same in Mozambique. So, um, and everybody has to go online. So the restaurants now, they have to be online and deliver. Uh, everybody has to figure out how e-commerce e is, is working. You just don't have a choice. And I, I think then, so it's very, it's too early to tell and we'd have to do studies and look at numbers, but we're probably fast tracking the internet adoption on the continent by five to 10 years, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited for the creative industries in that regard, because this is really, this was a, something we've all been waiting for and we've been, we've all been dependent on internet adoption for many of our businesses. Um, I mean, in 2012, I launched one of the first VOD uh, platforms on the continent. It was so, so early. I was way too early. Uh, and, and one of the problems was just getting enough people to be able to afford the service be online. First of all, one of the problems was, is it going to work? Is streaming going to work? So, and, and we had made some progress. But right now it's just it's just booming, right? And you, if you're you know at 8 p.m. Uh, on Instagram Live right now, you have, everybody's doing an Instagram Live. You have all these African celebrities doing interviews or DJ sets or whatever, and everybody's watching. It's huge. Everybody's on TikTok. Um, so, so I think, and that's gonna last because this is the future anyway. Uh, so I'm I'm that's the strategy really is is. I mean, one on the infrastructure side and the government side and the telco, telco side, just make sure you're putting all the resources available for people to go online, which they are doing already. And on the, on the creative entrepreneur side, it's just go, go all in on digital if you're not there already. Um, and the ones who are able to do that, even if they suffer for the entire year, eventually new business models will arise. I am really looking for the time where you'll be able to monetize Instagram lives you're going to have a schedule. Maybe you're, you, you know, some, some of the content will be accessible for a fee or there's going to be advertising or product placement or anything. Same thing on TikTok. Um, I would love for WhatsApp to allow monetization also of channels, which is not available right now, but the number of people just sharing content or communicating on WhatsApp, you have no way of monetizing this at the moment. So, you know, and, and same with Facebook and Twitter. I know they're all looking at that. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm quite excited actually about, about that aspect of the crisis. Thank you, Maria. And uh, of course, uh, it's good that a good point you mentioned, especially from the African perspective in terms of uh, 
entrepreneurs getting online, which will give them a global exposure. We know in, in London, in Paris, and the, we are starting to see quite a lot of uh, African designer coming into, into play in, in London fashion show, Paris, and New York, and the, probably the online will give them a global exposure. If I go to the music and, industry... And, and, so, so. So, sorry, just before I let, let it go, another trend, Suri, is that uh, with the closing of borders and the breaking down of supply chains, and of course everybody has realized you can't really rely on China to produce anything, or in Africa we're realizing you can't rely on the West to buy your physical products, another big trend is going to be uh, in intra-African trade. So the West supposed to be the launch, you know, of, of the, the free trade zone in Africa in July. It's, gonna, it's postponed because of COVID, but it's ultimately going to happen. And once tariffs within African countries are, are lowered or even canceled, that's going to spur another type of trade. And I'm because I'm thinking about this because you're mentioning fashion, and that's going to have a huge impact because right now the fashion industry is is a bit local, but then designers are also going straight to trying to sell to the U.S. or to Europe. And I know that now they're looking more how can we grow the Pan African market, mm -hmm. uh, which is also a great trend, and it needs to happen also. Ah, thank you. So if, you, if I go to Amo and the MC before we go to Jimea and then we can take some questions and I hope uh, Dennis also will give us a, an overview, some of the key observation and some of the questions that have been submitted. From the, in the, in the, in the uh, music industry, of course, Amo has highlighted some of huge disruption in terms of venues and all those and we've, we've seen a shift in terms of uh, producers and the gig moving virtually. Are we likely to see a permanent shift? Are we likely to return back to normal, see all the 20,000 gigs and all those, or people will just be sitting at home, enjoy, enjoy the, the entertainment on their comfort zone, which will affect all the, some of the, 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 the suppliers in, in the space. I'm also your thought and then EMC and then, uh, so, so, so I think audiences are very, very different uh, depending on genre of music, where you sit globally. But so there's, there's one train of thought around uh, using, uh, somebody mentioned it earlier, AI and how do you integrate tech into live music? So, so some of the, uh, you know, really large tech companies are working with some of the large uh, uh, touring companies like Live Nation just to look at you know what's the scope of me putting a hat on and zooming into a Beyonce concert in Los Angeles you know so there's that train of thought can we do that do will we have the technology and how would that look like problem with the gig economy is most people like to be at the gig you know so I think there's a whole rush of us to digitalize everything you know we're talking about digital festivals uh, get online jump this but you know what as humans people that go to gigs whether it's theater music drama you know we like to be next to each other and we you know uh, you know so uh, and, and there's certain dance moves that you want to do with people rather than in your bedroom uh, and you want to be able to look left and right and, you know, and have those smells. So it's a really, really hard, complex thing. We don't know. What we do know is I, I think there's an opportunity. So you can, uh, from a music and from, a, I suppose, an arts perspective, if you look at big cities, generally, most arts, music investment tends to be centralised into city centres. And people look at that as a kind of, monetary inward investment uh, 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 policy um, statement from cities in, you know, around, around the world. And I think what COVID has done is say, well, perhaps it, we don't need to make and force people to travel to these city centre venues. Perhaps we need to take content to where people are uh, in places, <laughs> in parks, obviously uh, in safe environments. So I think there, there's a unique opportunity to actually take you know rather than doing african music at the south bank why don't you take african music to you know tottenham or seven sisters in a park uh, you know i'll use that as an ex a broad example and i think there's a bit of a unique example to uh, use citizens uh, and and place making uh, as a bit of a journey to move this narrative away from city centers um i don't know what 
it's got to look like. Uh, and I say that with uh, quite a lot of information that's been thrown at me. I, I just genuinely don't. And if I did, I'd be lying to you. I'd be making it up. Um, I think we just have to protect those spaces that are very vulnerable, that if they go, they're not going to go for the next year or two years. They're going to, they'll be gone for a hundred years. Uh, and and, and uh, we, as a company, we've spent a lot of time supporting those independent venues that we feel are a critical part of our ecosystem, right at the beginning stages. Not the, not the sort of main venues that we're aware of or the main the main festivals that you're all aware of so uh two things one is ai perhaps the other thing is i don't know uh, emc what's your what's your thought how do you see mm -hmm. i mean just uh, to take on, yeah 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 just to take on from ammo i think it's an opportunity actually to really make the case for the creative and cultural industries. Um, it's been an ongoing conversation, um, uh, you know, across the UK and with all the work that I'm doing across Africa. Um, and, you know, I really want to look at this in a more of a practical way. Um, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, you know. Um, we're in a situation where I'm doing this, let's hope for the best and plan for the worst you know and um and very much so it's about being part of the solution um i think it was already presented you know l let's look at um working with other sectors the creative industries has always been charged to do that um the immediate one has been tech but we actually decided that we would work with education about uh three years ago we set up an arts education charity in Nigeria because we wanted to, we saw the arts as a way to make education more accessible and inclusive for people, especially because there was such a high levels of illiteracy and we just felt that people can have a voice even if they can't read or write. And as soon as um, the situation happened, the COVID crisis happened, we've been able to create these home learning kits and we've been able to print them and get the local newspapers to print them and get them to um, children across the country. And it's picking up um, momentum and speed and people are lending their um, resources to print these and distribute them, you know, because we're so far away from a digital revolution. Um, in some parts of the world that we have to be part of that solution as well and yes okay there's loads of opportunities but let's that the opportunity for me has been part of the solution um, but I like to always be mindful that if you want to be part of the solution and I've been because I was on um, uh, I struggle with <laughs> what it is is that I struggle with the fact that when you're part of the solution you know you have to look after yourself as well and there was a really wonderful saying that I had you know you you can't pour from an empty jug and it's really resonates with me so much and I'm my company Hatch we've been able to support a lot of people through this um, situation by providing them um, with um, business advice yeah really basic practical stuff just to keep them going but believe you me the only reason we're doing that is because I'm so I'm looking after myself first you know and I think that's the most important thing that we can do right now is take that time to actually value ourselves and I know that we want to say things like let's re let's be practical let's respond to audiences yes absolutely but if you're burnt out you know so I think let's um you know in terms of responding to your question more directly let's be part of the solution but in so being you know let's make sure that this is a real opportunity for us to make the case for the creative industries and make the case for the creative themselves in, uh, thanks MC, for that and uh, if i go to janelle janelle what's your thought in terms of uh, where the opportunities are likely to come from the media no media at the moment uh, at the at the forefront in terms of but there's also a lot of shift and the competition with the social media at the same time and uh, where do you see and do, what are the best strategy moving forward for those who are in the media to come out competitively yeah i think um in the media i think 
there's just a chance for people to tell their stories more authentically for the people who are ready to share them and for people to if this is what they want to do grow their followers you know kind of grow their audiences and be speaking to more and more people who resonate with the things that they want to share so i think from that point of view there are loads of opportunities you know even for myself i think you know as a former journalist um comms storytelling marketing you know those are interesting avenues for those kind of creatives who want to kind of pivot and do something a bit differently and i think you know if anything this has shown us is that people want to hear from a variety of voices i think we're learning that people do want to hear about from that diversity of thought and so i think there are opportunities for people who want to get into that space of content creation i hear what you're saying about a bit blurred and who are the content creators and who are the artists and you know kind of who's who but i think there are just opportunities for people who want to take them to speak to ever-growing audiences and, and I, I it's really hard because i don't think we can say this is going to happen because or what's going to happen i think it was really interesting when they say okay well everyone go out the house now and people are like no no we're not ready to like leave yet we're not ready to be together yet so i i, I do wonder what the long-term effects will be of how people will want to gather how they'll want to do stuff so i think digital at the moment is still a great space to occupy because that's the one sure space where people are definitely going to be for the next few months because this is definitely a marathon and I don't think we're in the even in the middle part of this marathon and what it will be yet not financially not in terms of time spent in lockdown what lockdown will look like how we exit lockdown none of those things have been talked about so I think if you are the kind of media creative wanting to create content i think now is the moment to kind of think about what you want to say the platforms you want to say it on and be strategizing how you're going to kind of build your audience and think about the potential ways that you could try and monetize that not knowing really what the future is exactly going to look like but look at a range of options and i was speaking uh, to some leaders today and really you know i think it's been alluded to in terms of how we look after ourselves it's about how you lead yourself out of where we are because you know although we're going through covid for the first time you know many of us will have been through life changing altering situations before how did you lead yourself out of that to where you are and to really try and dig deep and, and use some of those principles to continue leading yourself and knowing that mentally it's a bit of a marathon because some days super productive some days achieving nothing <laughs> if i'm honest in terms of of making stuff because some days i'm just not up to it because of everything that's going on so i think it's just taking that balanced approach and as i kind of said today on one social space you don't have to pick a side about whether you're being productive and monetizing or not I, you know i think that's kind of a myth that we need to make those decisions now we don't and in any case i always like to believe there's kind of a third way that you can take that's a sliding scale of somewhere in the middle so I think it's not to make knee-jerk reactions. I think it's to think about the potential outcomes and think about where you might want to place yourself, all things being equal with how they could plot out, but without really knowing where we're all going to land and how long it's going to take, but I think longer than we think it is now. Yeah. Thanks, Eugenelle. I know Dennis has been listening quietly, analyzing what the speakers are talking about. Dennis, do you agree with some of the speakers, some of the key things they've highlighted and also i know you've been going through some of the questions that has been posted and uh, please anybody on the on the listen to us if you have a question raise your hands while dennis is taking summarizing some of the key things that the speakers has been to dennis what's your thoughts well, can you critics uh, critic some of the <laughs> yes we can hear you we can hear oh Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear now. Oh, okay, good. Uh, no, I'm very mindful of the time, so I'll really just summarize, but also to say that uh, I was paying very much attention to the discussions and they were very interesting, thought provoking. I was also wondering what was happening on other platforms and on YouTube um, and others. But just to summarize, I think it's very clear that uh, the creative industry has had significant impact and influence on 
the lives and livelihoods of virtually very many people uh, during this lockdown. Uh, and uh, almost all the speakers highlighted to the various things that have been happening in terms of uh, uh, music, gaming, virtual tours, name it. So, and, and digital has been at the center of that. I think one of the other key things that came across was that the audiences are different and the challenges are going to be different. So in the Western hemisphere or in Europe uh, and the whole world, digital, data, infrastructure, those are not big institutional voids or challenges, but on the African continent, I'm also very much familiar with the challenges that are happening in there. So the audiences are going to be different and creatives are being creative in different ways in different regions. Uh, but one of the challenges that was highlighted, I think, from the discussions was challenges of value capture and monetization. Uh, I mean, if you're holding an event, a live musical event, and people want to be there, how do you, once you've done it virtually, how do you capture and monetize that value? And I think the challenges will be different from each sector. Uh, so I, I don't know how that's going to be resolved. But the other key theme that came through was that uh, this idea of united we stand. Um, no, no, united we stream, I think was the word. Uh, united we stream. <laughs> uh, I, I thought that was very interesting. And I've seen a lot on social media, on a number of things, uh, TikTok everywhere. Everyone has been at it. Uh, but what I hadn't seen is the coming together of different players in different spaces uh, streaming together, so to speak. Uh, but obviously, the creative industry is not my area of expertise, so I was not privy to those spaces, but I'm sure a lot lots of stuff is happening. And that is likely to be the new normal once everyone has gotten used to these platforms. I signed up to TikTok for the first time and I found it very interesting, so there we are. Uh, in terms of uh, we as, as the One Africa Network, we've had to adjust, as uh, Dr. Kerry mentioned, most of our events would have been either in universities or, or hotels, and we've had to pivot and go online. And going forward, we'll be doing a number of things to do with um, uh, master classes, uh, expert uh, sessions delivered by expert, experts from different industries. And I would encourage all the listeners and the viewers uh, to, to look out for the things that we have coming up, but also for the expert panelists and the creatives that are on this call to give us a hand when we reach out because this is not our area of expertise and we'd love to be very creative in the way we are going to be engaging with the community going forward. Uh, but maybe one last observation uh, is that I have noticed that this is the most gender uh, sensitive panel that we've had. So thank you very much, Eugene, for putting the panel together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that observation. So if I take the question from China and then we can wrap up from the speaker. China, you have a question. If you don't mind, be a bit brief in terms of your question and then... Chesna. Ah, hi, how are you doing? Not uh, good to see you, Yamisi. Uh, it's a bit cold here. Uh, I'm in Zimbabwe, uh, Harare to be specific. I just, uh, I think it's been a very valuable co conversation. Just to cut to the chase of my question is how can we systemically increase the number of new voices from the creative sector? I think one thing that COVID has highlighted for me is, as I watch these live streams is there are so many talented voices that consistently gets swallowed by what we want to term gatekeepers. Um, when we go into the phase of renewal, how do we build systems that are going to increase the voice of the new creatives? Because particularly when you look from an African perspective, that's what's going to build a robust um, creative sector. That's what's going to increase the trade of services. That's what's going to increase intra-Africa trade. How do we build that system is my intrigue. Thank yeah. you. I don't know who, who wants to answer that question. Um, I don't have an answer, but we are working on it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, so we've um, actually used this time and Google Drive to bring um, 40 different creatives together and hopefully um, we'll be able to create um, these um, networks in various different parts of the world yeah so we can have amplification 
um, like I said, we, I don't know how it's going to work, but it's very much like having um, these critical masses all over um, singular kind of like ideology and mission. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if there's anybody that wants to participate in anything like that, this is our moment where we have to um, collaborate. We have to create consortiums, like literally get contracts with each other um, and have um, joint manifestos because this is long overdue. This isn't anything to do with COVID actually. COVID is helping us to accelerate what we needed to do anyway. I don't have the answer, but I'm definitely open to be part of a conversation to get to that place. I will ring you. <laughs> any, any, anybody else who has a, an additional comment on that? Yeah, maybe I'll say something. I mean, on, on my side, and you've understood, I really have the point of view of, of you know, uh, the, the investor here. I'm really trying to channel funds into the African creative sector. So I'm constantly doing the go between uh, and between investors, whether there are development banks or commercial banks or um, you know, private investment firms or corporates from around the world. And I can tell you that there's more and more interest in um, African creatives right now. There is a lot. The Americans are looking a lot. Uh, the Europeans as well, but I have to say the Americans are looking more. I think it's because of course there's Hollywood and there's, they understand how that can be a business. So I, at least I don't have to explain that to them. They, they already come with that. and. Um, yeah, just to add that we're actually looking. I, I spend hours and hours every day and every week just going through every social media that I have, following links, looking at who's doing what, who's the new person, who's doing something interesting. I actually have a newsletter called Hustle and Flow every week where I look for um, um, everything that's happening that's exciting on the continent and, and that goes out to almost 500 investors. Uh, and and they're reading and they're really paying attention and they're following the links and they're looking at what people are doing. So what I would say is that people are actually looking. Uh, mm. It's going to take some time, but uh, you know there's attention. Just have to use the tools that are at your disposal as efficiently as possible. So you know, create great content, get people to retweet you or post about you, leverage social media as much as possible, uh, and you can collaborate with others and put stuff online where actually a lot of people are looking then it might take some time you know to to create the connections and, and get the money flowing but but it's not in a vacuum um so and i've been doing this for 15 years and i can tell you that it's now changing like for literally for for i would say 13 years nobody was looking and now finally people are looking so continue continue to do your work thank you Mali, for the additional comment uh, unfortunately, we, we, we are running out of time and it's been amazing hearing from you. So if just to wrap up, if I probably will I get our speaker to give one minute conclusion in terms of what will be, how did they see moving forward in terms of what, to, what will be your, your, your conclusion summary. One minute, please. Yeah, to probably I'll start with uh, uh, Charlotte and Fiona and then we go. Um, I, I'm not sure <laughs> who you wanted to go first, well, I'll jump in. Um, uh, uh, do you want me to go first? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, go I'll, for it. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> see that rescue. And uh, now, uh, my, my thing is, um, we've been generally talking to, so it's not just about government, it's about obviously the, co the connection between subsidised and commercial. And, and during this period, um, sometimes the creative industries, it's not as valued as perhaps other sectors. And I think uh, what's happened now with the momentum that's happened and people understanding art is connected to well-being, is connected to our own lives. Uh, we're, 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 we're hopefully we're seeing the day, uh, we're seeing a little bit of light. And what's just been announced is the culture secretary has just okay. announced a cultural renewal task force. What that means is they're taking what we do a lot more seriously than what they've perhaps used to. Uh, they know we're a growth economy and they know that we, the work that we do affects health. So I'll just give you a quick, if we were as a sector to take, I think it was half a percentage of the health sector. So if you connect, say, dance to 
uh, uh, I don't know, uh, um, uh, just kind of uh, any type of, you know, uh, sort of illness that perhaps older people have in terms of their well-being. Uh, if we were to take a very small percentage and, and, and evidence that, our sector would grow by double in terms of government investment. So this is the stuff that we really need to look at. You know, how do we connect dance to dementia? Well, you've got the evidence is there. We just need to roll it out a little bit. And we need key players to really become the new voices. Uh, and, and those voices need to be intergenerational, more diverse, and more reflective of the societies that we live in. I, I couldn't agree more yet, Ammo. I might step in there as my conclusion. Um, great to see the task force set up. Um, but actually, um, I'm setting up a new network um, uh, called the XOR uh, Mind Body Collective, which brings creative industries, the mental health care sector, and um, XOR together. So I'd love to share details to do exactly that. I'm always just to show the value and impact of the creative sector on our overall well-being, and um, because that is the data that people need to see in terms of a different type of value that the creative industries holds for society and for culture. Thank you, Fiona and um, Of course, there was a, a <clears throat> quite a lot of discussion going on in terms of how the creative industry will play a major role in terms of helping people to manage mental health and well-being as a true cultural content as we come out of the the lockdown so it will be very critical so uh, charlotte and the uh, emc and the uh, mali what's your one minute summary um so i mean oh god um it's yeah it, it, it's i think there's you know it's a really um it's a it's a really nuts time and i think uh, i think there's been some really valuable kind of contributions this evening about and and, and in this focus on kind of people's mental health and well-being and and the emissary's previous focus on your you know looking after your own you know putting fitting the oxygen mask to yourself first kind of thing um being really important but also um acknowledging that this kind of big sort of shakeout also means that there's loads of opportunity to reimagine how we do things um, and uh, and 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 how we operate and 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 you know think because we haven't had to put various things together before we haven't seen where those opportunities are and you know I, I think it'd be um, I think it's going to be really fascinating I mean and maybe I have the just the privilege of being somebody who works in research where you do get to kind of look at stuff um, to, to see where this all goes, you know. So, you know, uh, it'd, be, it'd be great to actually kind of capture some of the, um, I remember there is a lot of research going on at the moment, but, you know, capturing the uh, kind of the journeys that businesses and creative uh, <coughs> entrepreneurs go through over the next kind of 12, uh, 24 months sort of thing. So, yeah. Um. Good luck. How about the rest, uh, Janelle, EMC, and Marie? What's your last one minute summary? Hmm? I've talked enough. I've said everything I have to say, so I'll leave the, my one minute to the others. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll just say because we don't know um, what's going to happen, um, we have to look at this like any other point. Um, in our lifetime where we've had to overcome really huge challenges and we're doing it on a global scale. So I'd say be part of the solution. I mean, I've said these already, but be part of the solution. Um, this is an opportunity to link with other industries, um, creative industries and health, creative industries and agriculture, um, you know, you name it. This is an opportunity to be part of the R&D planning, th you know, throughout it all. Partner, and create consortiums partnering um, to share resources and ideas. I know that I can't fill in all the applications. I know that I can't see all the opportunities, but this is an opportunity to really create those long-term partners and consortiums. So when opportunities do come through, you'll be ready. Um, and, you know, get support. Um, you know, we're all here on this session right now to do that. So I'd say continue to do that. And I'll say it again, rest. You know, um, take time to be creative, and um, and we've said already this is a marathon. I feel like it's one of those obstacle courses that <laughs> has barbed wire, and sometimes there's a moment where you can lie down and rest and enjoy the sun. So you know, and I think they call it life. But you know, so yeah, so make sure you take time to rest. 
Anyway, that's thank my one minute, 30 seconds. <laughs> thank you, Jamesy, for that. How about you, Janelle? What's your closing remark? Yeah, I think my closing remark, people have alluded to it. I think for creative industries, we need to just try and build our own ecosystems. Government help is great, but we know sometimes those things come with lots of caveats and not necessarily the diversity of thought that we really would want to put into it. So I think a few people have alluded to building their own networks. And I think the creative industry should continue to do that to um, secure a long-term future for themselves. <clears throat> On that note, it's been amazing listening and learning from everyone. Clearly, there's a the creative industry face a huge challenges ahead, lots of unknown, and of course, at the same time, opportunities, depending on how people look and how we emerge from the lockdown. But the future is bright. We just need to stay positive and they work collaboratively, share resources, and they um, support each other because the challenges ahead are, are quite are quite strong and we need to work with. So thank you so much. It's been amazing. I hope you find the discussion thought provoking and insightful. Hope you've, you've uh, taken a few key takeaways that you can either adopt it today or tomorrow to help you navigate the, the current moving situation. And hopefully you'll emerge from the end of the tunnel strongly and competitively ready to to play a bigger role in the creative industry and hopefully we can also export creativity out of the UK into the global arena and, and more future opportunities. Thank you so much and have a good evening and please Thank continue you. to join our discussion every week. So we have it every every Friday so, and Wednesday. So welcome and thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye.